Bienvenidos, Ushamdi, and welcome. CMIT 454, sections 6380 and 6382, to the first eight-week term of the spring 2018 semester at the University of Maryland University College. This is the Cis Cisco Networking Academy CCNA Security version 2.0 course. And this morning's Packet Tracer tutorial and solution set is going to be on Packet Tracer activity 6.3, dot one dot three where we're going to be taking an in-depth look at layer two vlan security and this activity appears to have quite a bit of moving parts so let's go ahead and dive in here you can see we're beginning to sort of ramp up the size and scope of the topologies that we're working with and we're going to be connecting a new redundant link between switch one and switch two and what they mean by redundant here is not that it's the second link between switch one and switch two, but it, that it's going to provide redundancy. And I'll talk about that when we put that link in there. We're gonna enable trunking and configure security on the new trunk link between switch one and two. We're gonna create a new management VLAN, VLAN 20, and we're gonna attach a management PC, which is this guy here, and maybe we can move him. Yeah, I think, I guess we can move that along with it. So we'll kind of bring him up a little closer here to the switch. So we've got a straight line going between them. And we're going to implement an ACL, an access control list, to prevent outside users from accessing the management VLAN. And I'll talk about that when we configure what appears to be what's called a router on a stick. Right, and I'll, when we get to that, I'll talk about that. But if you look here, it looks like it's a router on a stick, right? And that's how we're gonna be doing our inter VLAN routing. All right, a company's network is currently set up using two VLANs in addition, network administrator wants to get. Okay, so part one, so here we go. Let's verify connectivity. So between Charlie two, who's in VLAN 10, which is this PC here, and Charlie 3, who is in VLAN 10, and then Charlie 2 and Delta 1. If using a simple PDU GUI packet, be sure to ping twice. Oh yeah, to allow for the ARP, okay. So let's go ahead and pull the desktop up. Uh, we have no addressing table, correct? Yeah, there's no addressing table here. So we've got our work cut out for us. We're gonna have to dig in here and figure out that, okay, Charlie 2 is 192.168.10, dot one and then let's go back to the command prompt and let's see we need to test over to charlie three so again we're testing these two connectivity between these two pcs right here so if i come to the desktop actually i wanted to go to the not the config sure so i need the pc's ip and actually i could have done it from here what command can i run to get the information i need yeah ip config Right, and it shows that we are 192.168.10.2. So can I ping over to 192.168.10.1? And actually, I don't think it was one. It was one, okay, so can we ping PC Charlie two, I can. So what about from here? Can I ping over to 192.168.10. Ping 192. Whoops. 192.168.10.2, which is PC Charlie three. So we've got connectivity there. Everything works. What about connectivity between Charlie two, who's in VLAN ten, and D one in VLAN five? Now over here is VLAN five, right? And you can see we actually have D four in VLAN ten. And we've got a host in VLAN 5 here. So we have multiple VLANs on these access layer 2950 switches. So D1, and I'm going to talk about how these are communicating, because this may be causing some confusion right now. There may be a little cognitive dissonance with what you're seeing if you're thinking that, wait a second, I thought that we had VLAN separation on the switches, how is it that they're pinging each other in different VLANs? And we'll talk about that. So the IP here is 5.2. So can I ping 192.168.10? And we're trying to ping Charlie 2, who I believe was 10.1. So can I ping 
Let's see what happens. And this is where we may need to wait for an ARP packet, right? Because right now the PC is looking, and there it is. It works. So the PC looked into its network table and said, you know, I don't have the network 192.168.10.0 slash 24, 10 dot anything, where that IP address would fit in or be used. So I need to ARP out for my default gateway, and I'm going to send the packet up to that default gateway. Well, let's take a look here and let's see who is the default gateway. Well, it's 192.168.5.100. So let's talk about this because over here on this PC, it's going to be the same thing if I say ping 192.168.20 and what was the IP, or I'm sorry, .5.2, .5.2. And look at that. So I can ping between the VLANs, and this is kind of into the routing and switching domain of things here. And routing and switching is really the foundation of all other Cisco technology. So I can ping from Charlie 2 and VLAN 10. I can ping, and the packet goes up here. Now, here's the trick, right? Does the packet do this? Does it jump down here and come into Delta 2? Is that how this is working? What do you think? Because it certainly looks like that's how it's going to work. But here's the problem, right? Remember, VLAN separation, I can't just ping between different VLANs on switches at layer 2, right? I can't do that. I need some sort of mechanism to facilitate inter-VLAN routing. Because these are different subnets. VLAN 10 and VLAN 5 are on different subnets, are on different broadcast domains, are in different VLANs. So think of it like that. A VLAN is a subnet, is a broadcast domain. And so these are two different VLANs Therefore, they are two different subnets, two different broadcast domains. So if my default gateway is what we saw the value for, for, for PC Delta 2 and PC Charlie 2, how is it that they're pinging each other? How is this working? Well, let's answer this question first. Where is that IP address? And let's go to the config, and we'll go to the config here. Where is the default gateway here? So here the default gateway is 192.168.5.10 for VLAN 5, the third octet. And this is a very common uh, convention, is the third octet in your IP address corresponds to the VLAN that's being used. So our default gateway is .100 on VLAN 5, and our default gateway is 100 on VLAN 10. So where is that? Who is the default gateway here? Because we're clearly capable of forwarding traffic to a default gateway from the PC's perspective, so the gateway can deal with it. Well, when we look at this, these 2950s, these are all pure layer 2 devices. So where is the layer 3 device that we would be using to perform inter-VLAN routing? Yeah, it would have to be the router right here, router 1. Well, let's get on to router 1. And let's take a look and see what router 1 can tell us about how this traffic is being routed around this network. And ah, here we go. We got the password. So Cisco con PA55. No, C-I-S-C-O, C-O-N, P-A-55. There we go. All right, so we're in user exec as evidenced by the greater than sign. If I type the enable command, we go into privilege exec after I type in Cisco ENPA55. The routing and switching course I'm teaching right now doesn't require all these passwords, which is nice. But again, in reality, you want to make sure your, your devices are secured with passwords. So we're at the, in the privilege exec mode. If I say show IP interface brief, well, look at this. We have are two default gateway IP addresses. And they happen to correspond to what is known as a sub-interface. So with 
gigabit Ethernet interfaces, I can create sub interfaces. In other words, think of these as pseudo virtual interfaces. And when I say pseudo virtual, I mean that they're not 100% virtual because they do correspond, they do have a physical interface, a physical parent interface on this router. It's that we create virtual interfaces that correspond to the different VLANs. Now, this is and I think this, this is probably not done intentionally to confuse you, but this is where learners become very confused with what this is referred to as a router on a stick, right? And I can create a router on a stick by taking that single virtual gigabit Ethernet 00, zero interface and carving it, carving it up so that it is serving... VLANs, whoops, VLAN 5, VLAN 10, and VLAN 15 traffic by creating what's called a sub interface. And we do this all with sub interfaces. These are referred to as sub interfaces. Now, Remember I just told you, and again, it's a security class, not a routing and switching class, which may be why they, they, did, they took the easy way out, but I'm confused as to why they did it here, and it matches, right? But they didn't do it here. Now, this is a very important point. On the switch, that is a trunk port, because remember, the definition, by definition, a trunk port passes what VLAN number? Yeah, by default, a trunk port will allow all VLANs to transit that trunk port. In other words, on the switch side, we have a trunk port. On the router side, we have sub interfaces that will be segregated by VLAN numbers. And so let's talk about that. And so you're probably looking at this and saying, well, wait, it's not VLAN 5, it's dot 1 here. Isn't that VLAN 1? Or if it's dot 2, isn't that VLAN 2? And again, this is done, and it's going to cause a lot of confusion, but we'll see that the sub-interface number does not have to match the VLAN number, right? Okay, so... We'll digest that here as we move on. And again, th this causes a lot of confusion. And th these, are, these are vintage and classic Cisco test questions that you'll see not only in chapter exams, but in other uh, domains. You'll see test questions like this because this causes lots and lots of confusion. So let's, we'll digress here for a second. We're going to take a step back. But that is the default gateway. It is the sub-interface address on gig00.1 for VLAN 5, gig00.2 for VLAN 10. And it's up here on the router. So the actual flow of the traffic is as follows. When I send a ping packet from Charlie 2, what happened, and, and I'm pinging, let's say that we're pinging Delta 2. Here's what happens. So here's the guy or gal that's running the ping command on PC Charlie 2. He types in ping 192.168, whoops, dot 168.5 dot, dot, and I think it's 2. So we'll just say this is dot 2 right here. He, ping, he types in over here, one, ping 192.168.5.2. PC Charlie 2 looks into its network table, and it says, hey, do I know about this network? And he, clearly he doesn't, right? Because he's on VLAN 10. He's 192.168.10. And I can't remember. We'll just say this, you know, 10.x slash 24. Right? So he says, no, I don't know anything about this network. 
So then, if he doesn't already have in his ARP cache the layer 3 information or the layer 2 uh, information for the default gateway, which again is that sub interface up here on the router, he'll fire an ARP packet out. And the ARP packet basically says, hey, I know the layer 3 information for the default gateway because it's configured on the PC. It says, and that's remember, we saw it over here in this configuration panel. Someone configured the PC so that if the PC didn't know the network that it's trying to communicate with, that it would send the traffic to the default gateway, which is the sub interface here on router one. The traffic gets to router one, and now it's router one's responsibility to then say, okay, this packet showed up, this ICMP ping packet showed up with a source IP of PC Charlie 2 and a destination IP of 192.168.5.2 for PC Delta 2. So now router 2 is going to look up in its routing table, its routing information database or the RIB, right? And the RIB is sort of the more um, cultured way to say the routing table, right? The routing table is the common way, but the RIB, the routing information database, and the RIB, the routing information database, and the routing table, they are all the same thing. It's the same. It's three different ways to say the same thing. It's the database that router one has that it's going to reference and look up to see, do I have a routing entry? Do I have a network? that this IP address would fall into, because if I do, I'm then going to do what routers do, and that is forward that traffic out the sub interface with a VLAN tag, and we're going to get to that portion, with a VLAN tag for VLAN 5, so that it hits the trunk port here, and now the switch says, hey, do I know how to get to that VLAN, I do. Well, okay, do I have a MAC address table entry, an ARP entry that corresponds to this IP? And if I do, I follow that layer two MAC address that's going to go via layer two information, the MAC address. It's going to get to this switch, and this switch is going to say, yeah, for that MAC address, you forward that traffic out that interface. So we go from a layer three forwarding scenario to ultimately a layer two forwarding scenario, and we end up here. And then VLAN, uh, I'm sorry, not VLAN five, host Delta two says, yeah, okay, that's cool. I got that ICMP request packet. Now I'm going to respond back to the original source with my ICMP echo reply. And that packet follows the same convention back, right? Except it's layer three and two information to get us to the default gateway. And then we come down here and we exit out that interface. And that is how the traffic is being inter VLAN routed via those default gateways that Charlie 2 and Delta 2 know about. So very, very important as to how this is working, right? Okay, so let's clear our topology there. So now we know that that is the default gateway, router 1. We know that's who's inter VLAN routing our packets. We know that it's router on a stick and that it's using sub interfaces. So we are now going to create, we're on part two here, we're going to create a redundant link between switch one and switch two. So how do we do that? Well, we've got to come down to the connections, and the connections are this little lightning bolt symbol. And it wants us to use a crossover cable. Now, when you mouse over, if you, you'll see right down here in the center of the main window, it'll tell you console, straight through, copper crossover, fiber, phone, coax cable, 
serial DCE, serial DTE. So we see all these different types. Well, we know we want a crossover cable, so we click that. And we're going to come up here. Now, does it tell us the port that it wants us to use? And it does. It says connect FA023 on switch 1. So I come down here and choose 23. And then I drag that over here as in the straightest line possible. And then I click again. And it wants FA23. And this is what you want to try to do in real life scenarios as well, is match the ports up, right? Always try to match the port numbers between the switches. It makes it so much easier. Because then when you're on switch 1, if you see that, oh, it's fast Ethernet 023, then you know that on the other side, it's fast Ethernet 023, right? It doesn't make sense to choose 23 on switch 1 and then come over here and be like, oh, I'm going to choose 16, right? unless you've got no other option. But here we've got the option, so we want these to match. Now, you can see we've set this up, and the ports, right, What it shows the status as red. So we need to enable trunking, including all trunk security mechanisms on the link between switch one and switch two. Now, trunking, and here they kind of give you, they bail you out right here, right? Because if you're reading this thinking, all trunking mechanisms, well, that could be a whole bunch of stuff, right? They kind of bail us out. Trunking's already be, been configured, right? So the new link must be configured for trunking, including all trunk security mechanisms. And so we kind of know that if we look at what the trunk links are configured for here between switch one and central and switch two and central, because these trunk, and they have to be trunking, right? Because that's the only way that multiple VLANs will make it up here to the router on a stick, and then we have inner VLAN routing, right? So let's jump on to switch one. Let's make this window much larger than it currently is. And I'm going to talk about the native VLAN. Again, we're seeing a lot of core routing and switching, or CCNA routing and switching um, concepts in this lab, right, that, that are typically not hardcore security concepts, but we need those foundational concepts in order to succeed with the security configuration. So here I am on switch one. I'm going to type enable. I know I'm going to get a password, and it's going to be Cisco ENPA55. So there we go. And now I'm in privilege exec mode. Well, from here, let's go ahead and say show IP interface brief. Let's see what IP addresses we have configured. What IP addresses are configured here? None. Again, this is a layer two, a native layer two switch, right? We've got no layer three addressing it no switched virtual interfaces are configured here yet, I believe. I'm pretty sure we're going to be doing that. So no switch virtual interfaces are configured here. But what, what do we do know? We do know we've got some trunking links. So if I say show run, and what how you would do this is show run interface fast Ethernet 0, uh, 24 is my guess. Because if we look, what's the only port that's up right now? Yeah, it, it's 24. Whoops, sorry. It's gig 01, but then it's 24 here. So let's see what 24 looks like. Now, Packet Tracer doesn't let you run this command. Packet Tracer is going to force you to say show run. And boy, be thankful this is not a 48 port switch, because now we're going to have to hit the space bar and go all the way down to see, all right, what do we set up for down here? So we take a look. Now, as we would anticipate, 24 is a trunk link, and gig01 is also a trunk. So on switch 1, right, we don't know which one's which. My guess is, is that the central, oh, there we go, gigabit, con okay, so gigabit connection. So the, the link here, my guess was going to be correct, was that that is the gigabit connection, which means that this is probably fast Ethernet 024. So I'm going to look at the gigabit connection on switch one, and I'm going to see that that is how they have the trunk port configured. And these are Cisco best practices. These are Cisco best practice recommendations right here is to hard code it as a trunk port so that the dynamic trunking protocol is not in play. And then to say switch port, no negotiate. So that turns dynamic trunking protocol off, right? 
And this switch port mode trunk hard codes the port as a trunk port and we'll be using .1Q, 802.1Q encapsulation over that trunk link. And then we have a native VLAN. And this is one of the concepts that learners new to routing and switching always become extremely confused on. What is the native VLAN? Why do we have the native VLAN? So here's why you have the native VLAN. In fact, let me clear the screen here. I want to get back over here to the trunk link. So the native VLAN serves the purpose that if, for whatever reason, and again, we're looking at, these are our trunk links, so that's a trunk link and this is a trunk link. And so here's what I'm gonna say. Let's say we have a device here and I'm gonna leave it blank, right? It's, I'll just put a question mark. It's device question mark right now. Plugged into a port here on the switch. The native VLAN serves the following function. Let's say that this device, device question mark, sends up frames that are not associated with any VLAN. They don't have a VLAN tag associated with them. Yet, they need to traverse or transit this trunk link. Because let's say that the traffic is coming over here to Delta 2. To this host for whatever reason, right? For whatever reason. If these show up with no VLAN tag and yet they must traverse that trunk link and possibly this trunk link and come up here and then come all the way back down to get here, how do they get across the trunk link with no VLAN tag? Exactly. They use the native VLAN. So that native VLAN value is used for traffic that has no VLAN tag associated. Now, you may be looking at this and saying, well, how is that even possible? And here's the device that can make all of that a possibility. Oops, sorry. I want a W in there. A hub. If this is a hub, it's possible. And again, realistically, are you ever going to see a hub in your environment? Now, you may, in some government environments, you might. And I've seen hubs recently in some government environments where you've got legacy, you know, government off the shelf, secret squirrel coded proprietary software that is plugged into a hub, right? But these have had to have been removed, right? This is a huge security problem because typically hubs are unmanaged devices, right? You simply plug it in and it connects in. And Cisco used to make very expensive hubs. However, these are not around. But with hubs, you could end up with non-VLAN tag traffic showing up that then has to transit a trunk link. And that is one scenario where you could have untagged traffic that needs to go across the trunk link, well, the native VLAN is going to come into play, and that is the VLAN number that would get assigned to untagged traffic, right? So that's why we have a native VLAN. And again, that is a very common, hardcore routing and switching, common core concept, I'll go common core, and we'll refer to the common core, right? It's a common core concept with routing and switching that that's why you use the native VLAN. That's why it says switch port trunk, native VLAN 15, because by default, the native VLAN is VLAN 1. And you never, ever, ever, ever want to use VLAN 1 as the native VLAN, right? Because you don't want it commingling with other control traffic that is going to be using VLAN 1. That even if we have VLAN 1, and this is a best practice here, right? Shut VLAN 1 down. Do not use VLAN 1. But even though we shut it down, and even though I could increase the security on these trunk ports, and I'm going to show you how to do it, we can en enhance this setup right here. And even though we're not going to get the points for it, this is what you want to do, is you want to limit the VLANs that are allowed to transit the trunk links, 
right? I want to scope it down so that only the VLANs that we're using are allowed to transit these trunk links. Now, even if I scope it down and don't include VLAN 1, there is control traffic between the switches that is on VLAN 1 that is going to get across that link, right? Because it has to. So what might be some of that control traffic? VLAN trunking protocol, right? DTP, dynamic trunking. Pro so even though I prune is the proper way to say that, even though I prune the traffic off of the trunk for VLAN 1, control traffic is going to get across. It has to, right? It has to. And that's another reason you don't want your native VLAN to be VLAN 1. You don't want to use VLAN 1 for anything. Anything. Okay, so Back to our trunk link on FA023. So now that I see how this is configured here, and let me make a note real quick to come back to uh, the VLAN allowed list, right? VLAN allowed. All right, there we go. So even though we've got this configuration here, we're going to be able to mimic it. So I go into global config interface fast ethernet 023, and I can literally do this. Copy paste. Boom. Now, what also do we need to do? Yeah, I need to say no shut. The port is shut down, right? The port is shut down. So I say interface fast ethernet 023. It says it changed its state to down, but why do we why do we know that's the case? Yeah, because over here the state is down as well. So let's come over here to switch number two and let's resolve that issue. We'll come to the CLI. We'll go from user exec to privilege exec, getting to enter in the Cisco ENPA55 password. We'll get into global config interface fast ethernet 023. And is it still in the, ah, beautiful. Still in the buffer. So we paste that config in and we say no shut. Now, is it gonna say that it's down? No, because now both ends are up. Why is it orange? And this is a very important reason. Very important. This is the spanning tree protocol. In fact, if it's not too late, can I say debug spanning tree, uh, spanning tree, or can we not do that? Debug, what do they have? Uh, ah, they don't have the debug for spanning tree here. So anyway, the reason it's orange is it's transitioning. I want to get this down a little bit here, not that. It's transitioning through the spanning tree states. It's going through the listening state and then the learning state, 15 seconds in the listening state, 15 seconds in the learning state, and then this will turn green when it, oh, actually, I'm sorry, that this one will not turn green, which is gonna get us into our spanning tree conversation. And then to the forwarding state. So fortuitous failure here, right? Why did this, not turn green. So this one did. So this guy went to listening, went to learning, and then transitioned to forwarding. Why did this one stay orange in the blocking state? We talked about spanning tree earlier, right? In 6.3.1.2, I think, was the packet tracer activity. Because what have I just created here by adding the redundant link? What is this? Yeah, it is a loop. And I'm doing this for effect, right? We've created a spanning tree loop that is a major problem. Let me clear that, right? So one of these ports in this topology must, and I shouldn't highlight that red, I apologize. We'll just circle it here must block the forwarding of traffic at layer two, because if it didn't, we have what? Exactly, we've got a loop in our layer two topology. And we know what is the TTL on layer two frames, the PD, excuse me, the protocol data unit at layer two. What is the method at layer two for the protocol data unit? It's a frame, and frames have no TTL, which means that they will sit here and loop and loop and loop and loop forever if, for whatever reason, we have a looping condition, right? And that is bad. So spanning tree is going to protect us from ourselves. 
and it's going to make this a blocking port. In fact, let's take a look at that. We know how to look at that information, which is on switch two. If I say show spanning tree, right? Fast Ethernet 023, what is the state? It is blocking, right? Now, the role says alternate, and with legacy spanning tree, there is no alternate role, but here's the thing. You shouldn't be using legacy spanning tree anyway. You should be using rapid spanning tree protocol. And in the rapid spanning tree protocol, it's called alternate. So Cisco makes the assumption that you're using rapid spanning tree protocol. And so they put alternate in here. Uh, but with the legacy spanning tree and PVST, this didn't exist. But they put it in here because you shouldn't be using legacy spanning tree. You should be using rapid spanning tree protocol. So anyway, it's an alternate port, which means, let's say that that link right there goes down, this link will transition to the forwarding state. In fact, let's take a look at that real briefly. So let's get into global config interface, uh, and it was the gig link. Gigabit Ethernet 01, shut. Now, take a look. Did it transition immediately? No, it's still orange, right? It's still orange because if I could debug here, what we would see is that it's in the listening state for 15 seconds. It's in the learning state because it's learning about the MAC addresses. It's listening for the BPDUs of all the other switches, right? The, and it's looking for the root bridge to try to determine who is the root bridge. And it's listening for that information, then it's learning all of that information, and then it's forwarding now. And that's why it turned green. So, and this is definitely legacy spanning tree protocol behavior. 15 seconds for listening, 15 seconds for learning. So what do we have? I mean, we don't have a blip here before it starts forwarding. We have an outage of like 30 to 45 seconds in some cases, right? So let's go ahead and resolve this. I'm gonna say no shut. Now, take a look what happens here. They're orange. Now everybody's orange because we're listening, right on this switch here, we're listening, we're trying to determine, hey, which port is gonna be my root port? Which, in other words, which port on switch two is closest, i.e. lowest cost to the root bridge? That is going to be the port that goes into the forwarding state. And the lowest cost, because these are fast Ethernet ports with a cost of 19, and these are gigabit faster, lower cost ports with a cost of what? A cost of four. Do show spanning tree. And there you can see, there's the cost. So my root port is the gig port because it is closest to the root bridge. And in fact, we see that the root bridge is whoever is 00, zero delta 5. Now my guess is, is that central? Can we confirm that? Let's confirm it so that we are being accurate in our description here, EN, and we get another Cisco ENPA 55 practice, and show spanning tree, whoops, spanning tree. And yeah, he is, is that right? 00164E200. Yeah. Oh, so for VLAN 10, VLAN 5. Yeah, okay, so he's the root for all of the VLANs. Yeah. So central is the root for all for all switches, right? It's the root bridge. Okay. So We've got the blocking port. We've talked about why it's the blocking port. We've configured our trunk links, and that's why this guy's going to stay in the blocking state, right? Because we don't want to loop. So that takes care of part two, step two. Now we're to part three. Yeah, set, hold on. On both switch one, switch two, set the port to the trunk. Assign the native VLANs 15 to the trunk port. Disable auto negotiation. All right, so we're good. And that disable auto negotiation, that is switch port no negotiate. It's disabling DTP, dynamic trunking protocol. In fact, to see that, and again, I want to make sure we cover this, do show interface fast Ethernet 023 switch port. This command is critical in routing and switching. Negotiation of trunking off. That means that the dynamic trunking protocol is off. And What's the administrative mode? Is it dynamic auto? No. Is it dynamic desirable? No. 
it is trunk because we said switch port mode trunk. Okay, so part three, enable VLAN 20 as a management VLAN. So the network administrator wants to access all switch and routing devices using a management PC. And it's going to be this guy right over here. So for security purposes, the administrator wants to ensure that all managed devices are on a separate VLAN, and this is a best practice. And we'll talk about this as we move on. Because you're probably saying, oh, well, why not just put that PC into VLAN 5 or VLAN 10 or the native VLAN? If I were to do that, every user PC in that same VLAN now has the capability of accessing the management IP addresses of your switches. And so do you want that? No, absolutely not. That is the, and in fact, remember, where are the majority of the security threats in your environment? Yeah, they're internal. They're disgruntled employees or not actively uh, engaged employees who have nothing better to do but to try to hook up their laptop to your network or to hook up their, um, you know, Linux hacking uh, PC to your, with Kali Linux into your network and to run Mac off or Mac OF, right? And to do a Mac flooding attack and to do things like that. The majority of the threats realistically are inside your environment. So the last thing that you want to do is to configure a switched virtual interface on all of these switches here in VLAN 10. Because then any user in VLAN 10 has the capability now of accessing those switches. And again, there's things that we can do to, to, to negate that, but I mean, that makes it way, I mean, that's a lot of work to make that happen. It's much easier to say, here's the management PC who is going to sit in the VLAN 20 by itself, and that is the only way that we're going to be able to access all of these switching devices. Because again, remember, when we look, and I'm looking for one, I don't have to type the password in. Okay, here we go. And on all of these devices, when I say show IP interface brief, and I do it like this, how many IP addresses are, are there any switch virtual interfaces configured on these switches? And the answer is no. And this is and I can tell, I guarantee this is the most common misconception you see in environments that you go into. And I've been in hundreds of customer environments. And I can't tell you how many times I come into environments that look very similar to this. And what the administrator has done is they've configured the switch and they think, oh, I have to put a switch virtual interface on here or else the PCs won't be able to send traffic around the layer two domain. And that is not true, right? That's not true, especially when you have a router on a stick. So you'll see administrators configure, oh, I need to come onto central and do interface VLAN 10, interface VLAN 15 for the native VLAN, interface VLAN 5 for everybody in VLAN 5. And all you're doing right there, right, on a layer two switch, that is not doing inter-VLAN routing, all you are doing is creating an IP address that now all of the users on VLAN 10 and VLAN 5 and any traffic that could hit the native VLAN, they can now try to get onto this switch and see if they can guess your password, right? The administrator password or, you know, depending on how you have your VTY lines configured, right? And so that is a huge security hole. And I've seen this. I've seen this on tons of environments I've gone into. So you want a management device that is in a management, whoops, a management VLAN by itself or with other management devices that are limited to the individuals who should be administering these devices. So let's go ahead and make this happen wants to access the round device. I'm reading, just reading here on a separate VLAN. Okay, good. So enable the management VLAN on switch A. So here is switch A, which I'm now going to have to log into. And let's stretch this out. 
So we're going to go into privilege exec from user exec, and it's Cisco EN, or yeah, ENPA55. All right, and we're going to do global config, and I'm going to say do show VLAN brief. And you can see we don't have VLAN 20. And let me say do show VTP status. I'm wondering if we're going to have to. OK, good. All right, so I see that it looks like they have VTP enabled here. Uh, so let's come back up here. OK, so create an interface VLAN 20 and assign an IP address within. And I guess we get to pick, right? So we're, we can pick whatever the IP is going to be in the 192.168.20.0 slash 24 network. So I'm on the switch here, and we're going to say, and it looks like VTP2 mode is disabled. We may have to do this on all the switches. So if I say interface VLAN 20, right, I'm coming into the switched virtual interface to say IP address 192.168.20, and for switch A, we'll use, uh, I'll use 10. And we configure it just like we would a physical layer 3 interface on a router. And then I say, no shut. Now, here's the problem right now. When I say do show IP, whoops, do show IP interface brief to see the layer 3 information, you can see that it shows that, yeah, you configured it. And I said no shut, but it says down, down. And this is also one of these inconvenient things that happens with Cisco devices is that the VLAN switch virtual interface, the switch virtual interface, will be down until there is an interface on this switch that is in VLAN 20, right? And it's kind of, again, a little mini security feature there. So enable the same management VLAN on all, uh, okay, so we are gonna get the bonus lab here, which is having to go to every single switch in the environment. And I'm trying to look as to how they want this to go down, okay. So create the management VLAN. All right, so let's create the VLAN as well. So we're gonna say VLAN 20. And now the VLAN is up. So I've created the VLAN and the interface that we, the SVI that we created is in that VLAN. So now we are up, right? So the VLAN has been created. Do show VLAN brief. Do show VLAN brief. And there we go. And it's active. So now we get the bonus lab. And that was switch A. So now we're coming to switch B. And we'll go to privilege or global config, Cisco ENPA 55. Go into global config, say VLAN 20. We could even name it if we wanted to. I'm going to name it the management VLAN, in fact. And, or actually, did it give me points for naming that? I didn't see that as a requirement, so we'll, we'll make that happen, though. We'll say name MGMT. That way, when you say do show VLAN brief, it's not just this you know kind of random, I have no clue what that stands for, right? So we know, oh, yeah, 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 VLAN 20, that's my management VLAN. And so then we're going to go into interface. Whoops, we're going to go into... And do they want IPs on everything? Yep, OK. So we're going to say interface VLAN 20. And I'm going to say IP address 192.168.20.11. So I'll just go in numerical order here. No shut, even though it says up. I like to say no shut just in case. Do show IP interface brief. And we are up, up with an IP. So now, how can we check that this is actually functioning right now? The PC is not plugged in, but I could say ping 192.168.20.10. Can I ping switch, uh, what switch was it? A, can I ping switch A? Absolutely, take a look. So from switch one, I can ping switch A. So we know right now that the VLANs are going across the trunk links, right? Because that's a trunk link right there, and so it's working. So now we'll come to central. And we're going to make central VLAN 20, name, management. And we are going to say interface VLAN 20. I'm sorry, yeah, interface VLAN 20. And it's up because I've got an interface in the VLAN. And it actually, I think I may have been backwards on the first switch. Um, it shows that it's up here because we've created the SVI. So the VLAN is showing that it's up. So let's do the IP address. And we're going to say 192.168.20. Uh, what did I say? 10, 11, 12. Oops, sorry. And we need a subnet mask in there. And there we go. So can I ping 192.168.20.10? Can I ping switch one? And we may have to wait a couple seconds here. There we go. I can ping switch one. What about 20.11? So can I ping 
and I can't remember, I think switch A and one is what we're pinging here. Yep, and it works, right? So in other words, I can ping the left-hand side of my configuration, and it's working, and that's great. So now we come over here to switch two. We get into global config, Cisco ENPA 55. We'll drag that to the right into global config, and we say VLAN 20. We're going to name it MGMT. I'm going to go into interface VLAN 20 because now I need to put the management IP address on here. IP address 192.168.20.10.11.12.10.11.12, and I guess this is going to be 13. Right now, can I ping 192.168.20.10? So again, I've got to get that layer 2 information to see how do I get there. Somebody's going to respond hopefully here. and it didn't work. All right, so we've got a little troubleshoot. Oh, there we go, and it there, okay, good. And it did, so patience, right? It did end up working, so can I ping 11? So if I can ping 10, which is beyond 11, I should be able to ping 11, and 11 works, and then can I ping 12, which is central? Yep, and so we've got connectivity, right? And last but not least, switch B. So we'll drag this over, and again, it's the same process. I come in here, get into Privilege Exec, Cisco ENPA 55. I get into Global Config with Configure Terminal. I say VLAN 20. I create my management VLAN. Uh, and then what do we do? We name it uh, MGMT, and then I'm going to get into the switched virtual interface, the Layer 3 virtual interface here, Interface VLAN 20, and I say IP address 192.168.20.14. And now we test. Can I ping to 192.168.10, I'm sorry, .20.10? And again, we may need to be patient here. And we got, yeah, at the very end, we got that last ping. So we can ping uh, ele uh, 10. Can we ping 11? And again, we want to make sure, want to validate I can get to every other device here. Yep. What about 12? And this should also work. There we go. And what about 13? And again, I'm 14, so 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All right, there we go. So it works. Now, we created the VLAN, we signed the IP, created the management VLAN on all switches, we did that. Create the interface VLAN 20 on all switches, assign them addresses, we did that. Now, you may be wondering and let me read four to make sure that they don't want this to happen. Oh, it looks like they do. Okay. Oh, I know why they, okay, because we're going to be creating the, yeah, so I'm reading ahead here. So you may wonder, okay, well, Travis, hold on a second. You, you put the SVIs on all the switches, right? But how is the management PC going to get to these other VLANs? Well, remember, the premise behind this is that we're not hooking the management PC up to get to these other PCs. We're hooking this management PC up to manage and get to the management interfaces, the switched virtual interfaces that we've created on these switches. So the purpose of this is not so that I can get to other PCs. I want to manage it. So I don't want to put that sub interface up here on the router because if I do, then what, what did I just do? Yeah, I just opened it up so that now PCs on VLAN 10 and VLAN 5, inner VLAN routing works, so they can now also get onto these switches. And that is not what we want. I want the VLAN separation, the VLAN segregation to serve one purpose, and that is to secure and make sure that only PC Charlie one here on VLAN 20 that only this PC gets to these switches. Now, having just said that, we look ahead here at part four, it and it, this is going to walk us into the ACLs, right? And that's fine. That's going to walk us into the ACLs, and it's going to undo what I just said. But think about that. This management PC right now, this management PC only needs to access these switches. There's no need for that management PC to come to these other PCs. And there's no need for the sub-interface here 
right? Because VLAN 20 is all its own little broadcast domain. So we're going to be able to access from PC Charlie 1 all of the switches. So let's do that, right? Let's go ahead and walk through this. So connect the management PC to switch A. And I moved it, I guess, prematurely. So now this is going to come. I thought it was going to come in here to switch 1. So we're going to come diagonal here to switch A. So how do we do that? We come to our connections. We click on the copper straight through. I come to this PC to Fast Ethernet 0. And then we're going to drag it down. And what port do we go into? Fast Ethernet 01, assure, assure that it's assigned an IP address. So Fast Ethernet 01. And we want to assign this guy an IP. So we come to the desktop config. And I'm going to say 192.168.20. dot, And we'll make this something uh, obvious, 99. That's the management PC. And that's the correct subnet mask. Now, let me ask you this. Do I need to put a default gateway in here? The answer is no. Right now, I do not. And the reason I don't need a default gateway is because, again, the premise here is that I'm only administering the devices that are in the same broadcast domain. And again, broadcast domain is a subnet, is a VLAN. Right? Those three terms we're using synonymously. A broadcast domain is a VLAN, is a subnet. So if PCC1, our management PC, is only administering and is only going to be in the same VLAN uh, as the devices it's administering, does it need a default gateway so that it can get off its network segment and go to VLANs 10 and 5? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And we're not going to this cloud, right, if this was an internet cloud out here of some kind. No, the management PC right now is doing one thing and one thing only, managing these devices. Now, this may change, right, and we'll address that when we get there. So can I ping 192.168.20.10, right? Can I ping switch A? No. Why not? Why can't I ping switch A? In fact, I can't ping anything right now. Exactly. This interface right here is down. It's down on the switch side. So let me see if they even asked you to configure that. It, oh, okay. So yeah, we'll take a look at what they do here. Interface Fast Ethernet 01 must be part of VLAN 20. Now, that's a pretty wide-ranging statement, don't you think? Now, for a security course, we've talked about a lot of ways to configure ports on switches. And my guess is you can almost be guaranteed that that little completion percentage right down there, the meter's not going to move if I only do this. So let's get into interface fast Ethernet 01, right? And I'm going to say, well, first let's bring it up. Let's say no shut. So if I do that, if that's all that I do, right, and you can see that we're going through the spanning tree state here, right? The PC's like, yeah, I'm up. I'm, I'm sensing that the, the port is up. I've got electro, uh, electro signal, elect, uh, electronic signals here. The port is up. But the switch is saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm going to go through the listening state and the learning state to make sure that you're not another switch and that there's nothing that I need to do in terms of blocking, right? I'm not going to get any BPDUs from you. So because you're an access port. So here we are on switch A. And this is 30 seconds, and we're done. So here we go. Back to the PC. Can I ping? Why can I not ping? Why is this not going to work? And it's not going to work. I could ping dot .10, dot .11, dot .12, dot .30. It's not going to work. Why is it not going to work? Exactly. Because all of the devices I'm trying to ping are in which VLAN? They're in VLAN 20. What VLAN, by default, if I say do show run... So here's my configuration on this port. What VLAN is that port in? Exactly. By default, all ports are in VLAN 1. And here's where we now come full circle. Do show interface fast Ethernet 01 to this command. Do show interface, uh, do show interface fast Ethernet 01 slash switch port. So we come full circle back to this command we looked at earlier because this is critical. Take a look. It's dynamic auto, which means the other end would have to be dynamic desirable or hard-coded as a trunk 
for this to form as a trunk. So this is how switch ports behave. It tries to, it, well, it listens for the negotiation, right? And if it's not, if it doesn't negotiate out, it falls back to a static access port. And as a access port, what is the default VLAN? Exactly, it's VLAN 1. So we know shut the port, and I got a bunch of points, right? But now we need to say what? Yeah, I need to say, whoops, not do, sorry. I need to say switch port access VLAN 20. Because the port has defaulted to an access port, now I've put it in the VLAN, is this going to work? Can I ping the switch to which I'm directly connected with the IP 192.168.20.10? And let's see what happens here. It doesn't appear that it's working. So I've said no shut. Do show, whoops, do show IP, whoops, show IP interface brief. Now, here's fast Ethernet 01. It's up, up. What VLAN is it in? Do show run. It shows it's switch port access VLAN 20. Let's recall that show switch port command. It's static access. It's in, and look at it, it even knows. It puts a little comment in there telling you, yeah, it's in the management VLAN. So if I'm in the management VLAN and the port is up, up, I can't ping. And I'm wondering if this is a packet tracer. So what we should do is we should hard code this switch port mode access, right? So we're going to hard code it as an access port. And it should have worked without that. But I'm wondering if packet tracer, and I think we got points for that. I'm wondering if packet tracer is expecting that to be part of the config. And it, it, it was. OK, so I would have to lab that to see. But I don't believe, because it, it was already negotiated as a static access port. So I don't believe you had to say switch port mode access. I think this may be a packet tracer phenomena that we had to say switch port mode access. But again, best practices, we would say switch port mode access, switch port access VLAN 20. I can now ping everything, but we're not done yet. Because this isn't the CCNA routing and switching course. This is the CCNA security course. So what did we say are best practices on all host-facing ports? We said that we should probably turn on, whoops, uh, not switch port, sorry, spanning tree. I'm going to say spanning tree port fast. Now, do we move up from 72% on the completion percentage? Because I'll be shocked if all they wanted you to do was enable the port and put it in VLAN 20. So no points for port fast, but what about this? Spanning tree, BP, sorry, BPDU guard enable. Do we get any points for that? We don't. I'm shocked. I got to tell you, I'm shocked right now. And then last but not least, spanning tree guard root. So on all host facing ports, these are best practices. This is what your host facing ports at a minimum should look like right there. At a minimum, port fast, uh, root guard, and BPDU guard. And I am, I've got to tell you, for a security course, I am shocked that we were not getting points for that because that wide ranging statement right here, oh yeah, must be a member of VLAN 20. Typically, what Packet Tracer does to you is they give you a statement like that, and then you come over here and say, switch port, mode access, switch port, access VLAN 20. And then you finish the activity with like 93%. And you're like, well, I, I did everything it asked, but you didn't read between the Cisco lines, which typically expect you to know, oh, well, it's a security course, and you know we're talking best practice. So I was kind of shocked that we didn't get points for that, but that's what we want. And last but not least, and maybe most importantly, is we put a description on here. Management, oops, sorry, management PC, access to net admins, only. And then I typically like to put in here like, you know, dot twenty dot ninety nine slash twenty four and then I'll put my initials in and then I'll follow it with the date zero two ten two oh one eight. Yeah, it's the tenth. 
And I'll put something like that in there, right? So that way somebody that comes after me says, oh, hey, uh, we need to do some cleanup here on the switch. Oh, yeah, okay, well, I probably shouldn't take this off, but let me go check with Travis and see, hey, are we still, is this legit? Are we using this? What are we doing here? Okay, so we've got that sorted out. We've put that in VLAN 20, and we put best practice settings on there, minimum best practice settings. So verify connectivity from the PC to all the switches. Well, we know that 10 works, right? Let's check 11. And these are all going to work. And again, we're in the same broadcast domain. So there we go. And let's check 12. And it's going to work. We're just waiting for the first request to time out. And there we go. And then 13. And just for completion sake, right, completeness, let's make sure that it works with 14 as well. We don't want to assume and then get into a scenario where we try to uh, tell Net or SSH to the device and then it doesn't work and it's because of something else. So time out and then there, we've got connectivity. So we're good uh, and we can ping everything. So now part four. So here's where we get into the second half of our conversation. And we're doing this because it's, it's walking us into, hey, you've got to configure the ACL. So enable a new sub interface on router one. We're going to create and okay, this is and this is going to be a great conversation piece. You'll notice they say create sub interface gigabit ethernet 00 0.3. Okay, well, sure, I'll do three, right? But we're going to talk about why why it three and why you would not want to use three. And then assign an IP address. Uh, just in that network right there. And I'm going to use 254 because that is my default gateway IP of choice. I don't like using .1. I like using the last usable IP. Okay, so on to router one we go. And let me pull that a skosh right back there. Good, good. And here we are. So uh, the password, Cisco ENPA55, Cisco ENPA55, am I typing it wrong three times? C-I-S-C-O-E-N-P-A-5-5. Uh, I thought, or is it is it class? What is the password on the router? Yeah, Cisco ENPA55. I thought I'd enter this before. Maybe I'm C, okay, here we go. C-I-S-C-O-E-N-P-A-5-5. Interesting. C-L-A-S-S. -S. Oh, wait a second. I'm sorry. C-I-S-C-O con P-A. Yeah, 55. Sorry about that. Thought we were, I was using the wrong password. My fault. Okay. So now we're going to type in Cisco E-N-P-A 55. <laughs> there we go. I forgot I was at the console there for a second. Okay. So we're in privilege exec and part four. So we're going to create the sub interface. Now you create the sub interface just like you would any other interface that you're going to go into on a router. I say interface gigabit ethernet 00 0.3. Now, they're using simply a numerical order for the sub interfaces with the first three. We used gig 00 0.1, gig 00 0.2, and now we're using gig 00 0.3. Now, in a real environment, you would never do this. I understand why they're doing it because it's easy, one, two, three. But then they diverge from that and they use 15 for VLAN 15. And maybe it's to confuse you, I don't know. But always, always, always match the sub interface number with the VLAN number for which it is going to be the sub interface. So that is what we would want to do. Now, I'm not going to do this here because I guarantee we're probably not going to get the points if I do that. So we'll stick with the convention that they're asking us to enter. But again, it doesn't have to match. The sub-interface number does not have to match the VLAN number. But you would be crazy not to do that, right? And I've done other videos and routing and switching courses where I talk about this because this is how they confuse you, right? When it comes to a chapter exam or some activity or maybe even on a certification exam, this is how they're going to get you. So know that it doesn't have to match, but you would be crazy not to match it. Because if I do that, 
and I go to troubleshoot, dot three, I may look at that and think, oh, it's VLAN 3 subinterface. No, it's not, right? We're using it for VLAN 20, but why did we do that to ourselves? So remember, you should, in the real world, use that in the Cisco learning world. We're using this right now. And you can see it brings the interface up immediately. Now, here's the next snafu that we're going to run into. I'm going to drive us right into this air. So we've created the subinterface. It says set the encapsulation to dot one q 20 to account for VLAN 20. And then assign an IP address. Well, maybe I think, oh, I know the IP I want to use because I already said IP address 192.168.20.254. We're going to use the last usable IP address in that slash 24 network. Now, I'm going to hit enter and I'm going to tell you ahead of time, this is not going to work. And we're going to get this error message here. It's going to say configuring IP routing on a LAN sub interface is only allowed if that sub interface on the router is already part of an, 80, an IEEE 802.10 or IEEE 802.1Q VLAN. So here's what we have to say first is incap.1q20. So why do I have to set the encapsulation for VLAN 20 on this sub interface? And again, you can clearly see does the sub interface number I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm in the wrong spot. Does the sub interface number match the encapsulation that we've set on that sub interface? And the answer is no, because it doesn't have to. The only thing that I need to make sure that matches is that that encapsulation number right there is the VLAN over here on all these switches down here that I want this interface to be participate, or the sub interface to be participating in. Right? So we've set up VLAN 20 everywhere. That better match. And here's why that better match. Remember, this is a trunk link between the switch and the router. It's router on a stick. There's going to be VLAN 5 traffic coming over that trunk link. I don't want the yellow green. There's going to be VLAN 10 traffic coming over that trunk link. There's going to be VLAN 20 traffic now coming over that trunk link. And this interface right here on the router has to have a way of differentiating the VLAN traffic for each of these VLANs that's showing up on that physical interface. And it divides it up by sub-interfaces that have this encapsulation statement that corresponds to one of these possible VLANs that shows up over the trunk link on the given sub interface. And this is how we do inner VLAN routing. This is also how we save a bunch of interfaces on the router. Because there's another way we could do this, and I'll, I'm not going to go deep dive, but very briefly, I could say, here's my switch, and instead of a trunk link, this is an access interface. And I say switch port access VLAN 5. And that connects to the router gig 0, 0. And then I could say, hey, I've got extra interfaces on the router. Here is switch port access VLAN 10, and that comes into another interface on the router, which happens to be Gigabit Ethernet 01. And then I could say for VLAN 20, my management, I just simply do an access VLAN 20 port on the switch and bring that up here into Gigabit Ethernet 02. And if this is a 2911 Cisco router, right, we'll say it's router 1, it's a 2911, that's going to work. But you know what you also just did? You also just used every single possible interface that comes on the router by default, right? So if you don't order any expansion cards and things like that, you get these three gig interfaces. You've just used them all. You've exhausted every bit of connectivity that router has. So in order to avoid doing that, 
we do router on a stick. So you can do this, which gives you full uh, inner VLAN routing. It's going to work just like it would if we did the router on a stick. And that's why router on a stick in smaller environments, that's the way you're going to do it, right? And again, if you only had a single VLAN, then yeah, you could do it just like that. Why not do it just like that? Put the router in the VLAN that you're using, if it's one VLAN, and give it the address like we did right here. And then everybody's going to get to it because there's no need for inner VLAN routing. But now we start to grow the environment, right? It requires multiple VLANs because maybe VLAN 5 is your HR group. Maybe VLAN 10 is your engineers. And we already know VLAN 20, that's my management, MG, whoops, MGMT. That's my management VLAN, right? So those are the different ways we could do this. Now, there's a third and final way, and that is that this whole environment is going into a multi-layer switch. Now, the problem is, take a look at our use case. What is our use case here? Switches do not support serial connectivity. So we're forced to get a router. Now, if this cloud connection coming in was coming in off of an Ethernet cable, right? Let's say it's Metro Ethernet, right? If this was a Metro Ethernet connection, yeah, okay, we're good. Or, you know, your Comcast router or your Verizon router. Then, sure, we could do a multi-layer switch, and I could hang VLAN 20 off of it with a bunch of PCs as long as the individual switch ports go into that VLAN. I could hang VLAN, what am I using here? Five. I could hang VLAN 10. And this would work. And we would have SVIs for each of these VLANs to do the inner VLAN routing. However, the topology we're dealing with here, it's dealing with serial connectivity, right? So three different ways we can do inner VLAN routing. We've chosen the router on a stick and now back to why we need that dot one Q to segregate the traffic that shows up here to tell router, to give router one an idea, right? Hey, here is how you're going to divide up the traffic that's coming across this trunk link that has all these different 802.1Q tags for VLAN 5, VLAN 10, VLAN 20, and the native VLAN. What if untagged traffic shows up? Yeah, the router deals with that too, VLAN 15. Okay, so we say incap.1q20, and now I can put the IP address on here. So at this point right here, it says be sure to configure the default gateway on the management PC, because now, and you can see we're at 80%, right? Now, can I ping my default gateway? 254. Absolutely, right? So the broadcast domain, the VLAN, the subnet, 192.168.20, I've got full reachability to everything in that subnet VLAN broadcast domain. But what if I wanted to go over and ping 10. Dot, and I can't remember for the life of me. Let's try to ping something in VLAN 10. Switch 2. Uh, I'm sorry, not switch to, Charlie 2, uh, PC Charlie 2, who is, and I want, where are we at here? I'm all lost. I want out of this config. There we go, one of the desktop, sorry, there we go. I want to ping 192.168.10.1. So 192.168.10.1. Can I ping something in VLAN 10? And the answer is no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We're going to give it a second here, because now that I've configured the... I'm sorry, yeah, no, the answer is no. I, I lost my place in where we're at in this discussion. So the answer is no. I can't ping anything on VLAN 10. Can I ping something on VLAN 5, maybe? Right, because remember, we set up the sub-interface up here. The router knows about VLAN 20. So when packets are showing up at the router, the router should be forwarding these packets. Why is it not? Why are the ping packets timing out? Exactly. The ping packets are timing out on PC Charlie 1 because we never configured the default gateway. So P 
PC Charlie 1 has no default gateway. He has no clue where he is supposed to forward packets going to networks that are, aren't currently in his network table. So let's resolve that. So this is a great configuration right here, and it works perfect if you only wanted to manage the devices with the PC, but the activity is walking us into an ACL scenario here. So I'm gonna say 192.168.20.254. So now I do have a default gateway, and therefore, I now should be able to ping devices on the other VLANs because inner VLAN routing now is working. However, what have we just done? Let me come over here to this PC here, and this is a user who's very upset about how much he gets paid and has been trying to destroy your environment for a very long time. So you've just set this up, and you think, great, this is going to work perfectly. So can the user on VLAN 10, Charlie 2, who's very upset right now about how much he gets paid, he's sitting around with nothing better to do, and he says, I wonder if I can get to the switches that are in this environment. And maybe he learned by a network diagram that you had laying on your desk or something like that, that all the devices are in this other VLAN. And he can't. Why can he not get there yet? And this, this is important, right? Why can he not get there yet? Yeah, because on the switches... Their management IP, it's as if the switch was a node. The switches have no default gateway set. And this is another common misconception that you'll see. You'll go into environments where they'll have a default gateway on the switches that points uh, to the default router, but it's a layer three switch and it's not needed. And so here we go. Be sure to configure the default gateway on the management PC, and we did that. So now the management PC can get to everything, but everything cannot get to the switches, right? So everybody else can't get to the switches. So we're okay now. So now we're gonna enable security. While the management PC must be able to access the router, no other PC should be able to access the management VLAN. Well, here's the thing is right now the PCs, they can't ping the switches, but can they ping the management PC? Yes, they can. And if they can ping the management PC, there's a chance that they could get onto the management PC. Remote desktop maybe, right? And from there they could get to the switches. Now they can't go directly to the switches. And let me close that conversation piece out. So they can't get directly to the switches. The reason they can't, Cisco ENPA 55, is because IP default gateway 192.168.20.254. So if the switch was going to behave like just another node on the network, I can give it a default gateway. Now, from that PC, watch what happens when I try to ping that switch, switch A which I think is dot 10. We'll find out shortly. Yeah, and it is. So if I put a default gateway on the switch, know that if you have inner VLAN routing set up, like this scenario that we have here, you're going to be able to get to that switch. Now, we weren't asked to do this, and so we're not going to, because again, the switches can get to the management PC. That's what they need to get to. They don't need to get off their network segment. And this is management plane traffic, not transit traffic. That IP default gateway statement, the misconception is, is that network admins put it on these layer two switches thinking, oh, now this switch can route traffic. No. All that IP default gateway statement is doing is allowing the switch to behave like a node on the network, like a PC that's on the network, and then it can get to other things on other VLANs. It gives the switch management traffic. When I ping from the switch, or when I telnet from the switch, or when I SSH from the switch, when I'm logged onto the switch, and it's behaving, I'm, I'm 
acting like it's a node on the network. That is what the default gateway is for. It's just like when we come to the PC and we enter in the config the default gateway. It's the same thing. That's what we're doing there. So we're not doing that here. So no one in any of these other VLANs is going to be able to get there. Now, I'm skeptical that we're going to get 20 points out of configuring an ACL, but it is, it's possible. So while the management PC must be able to access things, we're going to block it off for everybody else. So create an ACL that allows only the management PC to access the router. Apply the ACL to the proper interface or interfaces. And what does that mean, access the router? Now, there's multiple ways in which an ACL can be created to accomplish the necessary security. For this reason, grading on the portion of the activity is based on the correct connectivity requirements. The management PC must be able to connect to all switches in the router. All other PCs should not be able to connect to any devices in the management VLAN. Now, right now, they can't connect to any of the, oh, and here's the, and this is the Cisco, the, the details, right? To any devices within the management VLAN, including the management PC, right? And look at what they want you to validate right there. And I'm going to tell you why they've got this any devices within the management VLAN and why they ask you to ping D1 or from D1 to the management PC. Because right now on D1 here, let's, oops, sorry, let's validate. Can I ping the management PC? It has a default gateway, and inner VLAN routing is fired up and working on all cylinders. Dot 99. Yep. Remember, I can't access the switches because they don't have the IP default gateway statements on them. Because the traffic doesn't know how to get back to the default gateway for the management VLAN, which is the only IP that's configured on them. So this is a huge problem, right? So we have to solve it. And this is where, again, in this little note right here, is the difference between getting the points for the ACL and not. So nothing should be able to connect to anything on VLAN 20. So we're going to create and apply an ACL that allows only the management PC to access the router. And we're going to apply that to the proper interface or interfaces. So here's what we're going to say. We don't want anybody to be able to route through here. So we're going to exit out here. Now, does it say named or standard? What do they want? Is this the router? OK. So now we're blocking traffic. And my reading of this, and we're going to see if this works, is going to be at layer 3. Because we should be blocking the ping packets coming through the router and it's going to be VLAN 20 in the inbound direction. So there's a couple ways that we could do this. Here's how I'm going to do this. So we're going to say we're going to create a named ACL. So IP access list and I'm going to call this access list VLAN underscore or so VLAN 20 underscore only. Right and I have to say extended. We're going to say extended. And we're going to say permit IP. So permit any IP traffic. Uh, 192.168.20.0.0.0.255. So any traffic from the 192.168.20.0 is allowed to go anywhere, right? And we probably could have done this as a stand, standard ACL, but I'm going to use an extended, deny any, any, or I'm sorry, deny IP any, any. So we're going to approach it like that. So I created an extended ACL, named ACL, called VLAN 20 only, that only allows traffic from the 192.168.20.0 uh, to go, and I'm going to do it inbound, and here's how we're going to do this. We're going to go into interface gigabit ethernet 0 slash 0 0.3. And I'm going to say IP access group VLAN 20 underscore only inbound. 
And let's see if we get any points for that. And we do not. So I'm wondering if they're anticipating a standard ACL. So, right, good practice. Let's pull that off. Let's come back out of here. And I'm just going to do a standard ACL. No name. So we're going to say access list 1 permit 192.168.20.0, 0.0.0.0.0. Now let's get an interface zero, oops, sorry, zero slash zero dot three, IP access group one in. And does it like that? And it doesn't seem to like that either. Let me double check and make sure I didn't miss something here. Create an ACL that allows only the management PC to access the router. So apply the ACL to the proper interface. And so the access, the ping should not work. Unless it's a, it can't be a VTY uh, on the VTY lines because it's got to be the transit traffic. And let me, let me check results here so that I'm not spinning my wheels. I want to make sure real quickly. Oh, so they're actually taking points off because I put a name on the VLAN. So we'll address that. We'll address that shortly. And actually, wait a second. Okay, so here I am thinking that the name, did it actually give me the name? So the names are what's wrong, not the ACLs. All right. And this is going to fall under the category of fortuitous failure to read the directions properly. Did they say to name the VLANs? I missed that. VLAN 20 on switch A. Enable VLAN 20 on switch A. Create the interface VLAN 20. The management VLAN. I'm just checking here to see where they told me to name. Do they want that as the name? All right, well, let's check it out. So obviously, we've got an issue here. So interface VLAN 20, I'm sorry, VLAN 20 name. Do they want the name to be VLAN space 20? Because it can't be. Name VLAN 20? Is that going to get me any completion points? So the name is wrong, and I'm wondering, no name VLAN 20. Is it just supposed to have no name? Oh, my goodness. So me putting a name on there was actually taking points away. And five switches, four points each. All right, I get the bonus Cisco EN PA55. All right, so me trying to be... Too smart by half, VLAN 20, no name, MGMT. And that puts me at 88. This is going to put me at 92. And Cisco ENPA 55. So again, what happened, Cisco ENPA 55. What happened here is I put a name on there trying to be clever to make it a little nicer. And this is one of the side effects of Packet Tracer. Whoops. No name. MGMT. One of the side effects of Packet Tracer is it's, again, it's a software program and it is configured to grade things in a certain fashion and look for certain things. ENPA55, going to global config, VLAN20, no name, MGMT. And then finally, down to switch B. Okay, so this is interesting. Cisco ENPA55, global config, VLAN20, no name. MGMT. And we're at 100%. And I apologize. I did not see, I didn't catch that happening when it was happening. So back to the ACL. So let's get back on the router here. And I believe, and let's see, does this meet the requirement? Does it meet the requirement that the management PC must be able to connect to all switches and the router? And all other PCs should not be able to connect to any devices within the management VLAN, including the management PC. So is that going to work? So here I am on the PC. Can I ping 5.1? I can, right? So that works. Can I ping 10.1? I can get there. Now let's come over to Charlie 1. Can I ping the management PC? 192.168.20.99. Uh, 
and I can. So that is not working, right? So inner VLAN routing is still working. Can I ping 10 dot? Well, the switches you can't get to anyway. Now they're asking to test from D1, and this should work still, right? So we're gonna leave that bogus ACL on there just for a second. So I can still ping the management VLAN. And the reason for this might be a grading reason. So let's pull this ACL off of here. And I'm gonna say no. Right, so we've got two bogus uh, ACLs out there. So back to the ACL. How are we going to achieve this? We want to block it inbound or outbound, right? And now that I've walked through this, it's dawned on me. Let's do this. What if I was to block the traffic out that interface? So let's try that. Let's pull the router back up. And we've got two ACLs, do show access list, right? We've got two ACLs in play here. I've got the extended ACL and the standard ACL. Let's get back, or we're in the subinterface. Let's say IP access group, and I'm going to say VLAN 20. Did I do the wrong direction? Only outbound, meaning all traffic that is coming out of the VLAN 20 interface is going to be blocked, or should be blocked. So here we are in D1 and it's working. So it's the wrong direction is what I had in there initially, right? So we'll come over here to Charlie 2. Can it ping 20.99? No. So we've met the requirement, and hold on a second, all other PCs should not be able to connect to any devices within the management VLAN. Did it say the router? I thought it said the router. Oh, the, the, no, the PC should be able to connect. So here we go. Can the PC ping something on 10.1? It can't. And that's okay because we're blocking that traffic. What if I wanted the PC to be able to receive ICMP echo replies? Right? We've got the 100, right? Let's build. So we come over here and I'm going to say, all right. IP access, oops, sorry, access dash list extended VLAN 20 underscore only. And if I do a question mark here, you can see I can put a sequence number in there. So I'm going to put the deny is 20. I'm going to put sequence number 15 and say permit ICMP. Now I don't want to permit Oh, I want to permit it uh, from anywhere, and we'll say from anywhere to anywhere, but equal to what? Oh, wait, it doesn't recognize that. ICMP equal to echo reply. I only want to allow replies outbound. So now let's ping from Charlie 1. Ah, take a look at that. And now we've got connectivity over to the 10 and the 5, so I can ping those guys and I can check and see what's going on to make sure they're on the network. And this is a great way to tighten the grips on ICMP, right? And which ICMP traffic we're going to allow through. So again, let's get on the PC and let's SSH minus L over to SSH admin to, oh, wait a minute. Oh, okay, they wanted us to use 20.100. So I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna keep our address. We're not gonna go change the address. 192.168.20.254. It wanted us to use 100, but we use 254. And can I get logged in? Cisco uh, VTY PA55, I'm guessing, and I gotta go back over here and check this. I can't remember what it was. SH, okay. So CISCO SHPA55, and I'm getting that password wrong. Cisco SSH, I apologize. Cisco SSHPA55, and boom, we are on router one. So we got the ACL all sorted out. Where was the placement? The placement was on the sub interface, and I could have done this on the other. VLAN subinterfaces in the inbound direction, right? But then that's creating a bunch of ACLs. So we create one, we put it on the subinterface for VLAN 20 in the outbound direction. 
and there is the extended ACL that we used. And we used the extended ACL, right, because I wanted to get in there and sort of tweak the ICMP piece as well. And we have that deny IP any any at the end. In fact, we could even change that to uh, 20, deny IP, and this may say that it already exists. Is it not going to let me log? Deny IP any. Yeah, so it's not going to let me log. That's fine. So anyway, uh, I was going to log it and show that. But that didn't work. So the final thing that we could do, and this is a best practice, is on the trunk links. And I'm only, I'll only do it on, on this one switch here. Now, you'll know how it said, you know, secure the trunk links with the settings that we have. So we'll do it on 20, we'll just pick one, on 24. So what you would do and you would do this on all of your trunk links, as I would go on to the interface where the trunk link resides, and I would say, switch port trunk allowed VLAN list. I can say all, I can say everything accepts, I could, you know, or I could add if there's already a thing here, but this is what you want to do. What are the VLANs that we're using over the trunk links? I'm using 5, 10, and 20. Now you'll notice conspicuously here, VLAN 1 is not mentioned, and it should not be. And I'm sorry, I forgot the native VLAN. And 15. So 5, 10, 15, 20. That is the statement that you would want to see. Because if I say do show interface trunk, right, VLANs in the spanning tree forwarding state and not being pruned. This is the most important line right here. Th this little output down here, this is the most important output in most cases when you're troubleshooting, because in a lot of cases, um, the trunks will be up and they'll be working, everything will be fine, but it's pruning a VLAN unnecessarily for whatever the case may be. But here you can see, those are the VLANs that we're allowing. And take a look. Sorry, FA23 is what we did right there. We went in 23, right? Let me make sure. No, we went into 24. So it's got 15 and 20, and it's, that's a convergence thing. This has got to be, yeah, it's a convergence thing. So take a look. Because VLAN 1 is being allowed. That's a security flaw, right? You don't want VLAN 1 allowed across your trunk links. Because remember, the control traffic for the switches, the DTP, the VTP, that's going to get across whether you prune VLAN 1 or not. So here we go right there. That is what we want. That would be the best practice. And again, do show run. The interface setup is to say switch port trunk allowed and only allow the VLANs that you wish to transit those trunk links. All right, well, we've got the 100 out of 100. We met all the requirements. We took the long way to get here. But again, it's critical to understand a lot of the concepts that I covered in this video because they can come back and really cause a lot of confusion and trouble if you don't know what the specific settings are supposed to be for, especially when we talk about the inner VLAN routing and the management of the switches and that IP default gateway statement. All right, this is going to wrap up Packet Tracer Activity 6.3.1.3, where we looked at a lot of Layer 2 VLAN security. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a great weekend, and I will talk with you soon.